Good morning, Keel Street. Welcome back from the blackness. And let's read from God's Word together. All right, from Isaiah chapter 40. A voice of one calling. In the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And we know that John the Baptist was the fulfillment of this, preparing the way for Jesus to bring us the salvation that would include all of us, that all peoples would see the glory of the Lord revealed. Let's thank him for that. And call out to him. Come, Emmanuel, God with us. Come and reunite heaven and earth completely. 
Let us become what you intended us to be. Finish off the curse that has been plaguing this universe for which the whole creation is groaning and we too groan. Not only because of pain, not only because of suffering, but because there is something in us that longs for what is still to come. And it's you that gave us the taste for that. You are the one who showed us the kingdom and what it looks like. It's, it's light and life and love. Lord, you showed us. When you came the first time as Emmanuel, you didn't come in power and violence. You came in humility and gentleness. And you've made us to be that kind of kingdom, not a kingdom of, of revolutions, not a kingdom of, of, of rising up and throwing down the powers. The throwing down of the powers we leave to you, O oh Lord. But we wrestle. We wrestle in prayer that they may be made powerless. And Lord, we ask that you would change our character in order that the kingdom coming would simply come because we know your word has life in itself. All by itself. Whether the one who sows it sleeps or gets up, the seed grows. And we ask that you would put life in that seed that more people know about you. Come, Emmanuel. But we pray in the time that we have that you would fill your house for that is what you long to do, not wanting any to perish. In Jesus' name. And so it is good news that we have to tell <clears throat> because he came and opened the doors, invites all of us, doesn't worry about who's worthy. He just invites us to come.
It is good news, that gospel, that he has come. And as I mentioned last week, as, as any father, our Heavenly Father was proud that his son had entered the world. And he couldn't resist a musical number to celebrate. <coughs> so let us give glory to God in the highest places. So let us return to that night. Picture it in our minds. That scene that changed history.
I were to ask you how, how important are you, what would you say? It's not a question we normally ask, is it? Still, don't we all want to be significant? Don't we all want to matter, even if it's for just a few friends or family? Many of us might wish that we were more important than we are. Let's face it, all of us feel a little overlooked and taken granted for from time to time. One of my favorite movies is A Wonderful Life. You know, the story of the man, George Bailey, who his entire life is a list of interruptions. After graduating from high school, he wants to travel the world and then go to college. He, he wants to get out of his small town and move to the big city and become an architect, a, a planner of cities. He has the desire and he has the ability and even has opportunities. And all he wants to do is escape from the family business, the Bailey savings alone, building alone, and then follow his own path, follow his own passions, make his own way. What he wanted was independence and a life full of adventure, but every time he's about to embark on that life, an unexpected crisis would occur. And once again, his life was interrupted. In his own estimation, he never went anywhere and he never did anything that mattered. In fact, in the climax of the movie, he decides that his family and the world would be better without him. Ultimately, though, what he finds out is that the interrupted life that he lived might not have been what he wanted, but it became far more significant, far more important, and far more fulfilling than the life uninterrupted. Don't we all on some level want to be important? Don't we all want to make a difference? Don't we all want to have an impact? Isn't there a legacy we all want to leave behind, a footprint that shows that we've walked through this world? Of course there is. But the question becomes, how exactly do you leave a legacy? What does a legacy even look like? I guess it depends on who you're asking. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but our God measures importance in a way that's different from the world. In fact, importance in God's hands is often hidden, like a tiny mustard seed. It's like a pearl of great price buried in a field. Greatness is found in the simple, faithful gestures of a widow giving a penny in the service of God. Greatness is found in, in being a servant of all. Greatness is found in, in humility. Just look at Jesus, the greatest, most important person to ever live. God with us, God come near, whose life and sacrificial death split human history in two. One day every knee will bow before him. But when he first came into this world, Jesus' importance was almost completely missed. As one writer put it, the most important person in the history of the world snuck into town late one night and definitely did not stand, stay in a five-star hotel. Jesus was smuggled into Bethlehem through the womb of a teenage girl who gave birth in a barn. The truth is that God bypassed all the important people of Jesus' time. He influenced Caesar Augustus to issue a decree that would result in Jesus being born in Bethlehem but he doesn't invite him to the baby shower. And he completely ignores Herod and the political and religious elite of Jerusalem. None of them get invitations to God entering the world as one of us. In fact, the only people invited to Jesus' birth are people that can only be characterized as nobodies. For example, Mary was a teenage girl from a backwater town. In that world, at that time, you would have a difficult time coming up with someone considered more unimportant than a teenage girl from Nazareth. And Joseph, well, Joseph was a, was a poor carpenter, 
a working class man from a working class town. His days were long, his calluses hard, and his paychecks small. These two humble examples are the main players of God's earth-shattering transformational drama. If we take God's working out of the equation, though, Joseph and Mary would have lived and died, been known by a few who would have also lived and died. And then they would have been forgotten, never to enter the pages of history. But Mary and Joseph are not forgotten. 2,000 years after they lived, we still remember them. So the question I want us to examine today is, why do we remember them? Of course, the obvious answer has to be because of their connection to Jesus. But don't answer too fast. Let's dig a bit, a, a bit deeper and, and flesh out what makes their legacy pro so profound. Flesh out, get it? An incarnational bit of humor there. Let's take a moment and look at Mary and, and see what we can learn from her. In Luke's Gospel we read, In the sixth month God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. We're so familiar with this account that we don't stop and just live in it. First notice the phrase in the sixth month. What's that referring to? Well, the phrase points back to Elizabeth being pregnant with her son, who would be John the Baptist. She was in her sixth month when the angel appears to Mary. The point being that there's a sense of timing here. It's part of a bigger picture that Yahweh is painting. It's a larger story that encompasses everyone involved. Six months before this, the angel had appeared to Zechariah in the temple. And now he appears to Mary. In other words, God's at work. God has a plan. And things are happening according, his, according to his time and his will. Paul says in Galatians, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman. Now, here's something I want you never to forget. God's still working. God is still working his plan. Right now, in this moment, God is working his plan. In the midst of interrupted lives, surrounded by interrupted supply chains and interrupted travel plans and interrupted deadlines, Yahweh is busy doing what Yahweh does best, loving and saving his creation. His sovereign will plays out in the seconds and minutes of each day and in the lives and the circumstances of humble nobodies like, like Joseph and Mary and you and I. Notice the phrase, pledged to be married. In those words are lives with hopes and dreams and plans. In those words are the building blocks of a future. In those words are expectations and promises made. This is where things get complicated. Because not only does God have a, his plan, but we also have our plans. The question then becomes, what happens when his plans interrupt ours? One of the things we all must come to terms with as followers of Christ is that God's plans for our lives always involve adapting or even setting aside our own plans. In fact, I found that what I think are God's plans for my life end up being my version of how I expect or hope that God will work. But God invariably ends up doing something completely different. Can anyone identify with what I'm saying? Have you been surprised by God's plans? Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. They both had plans. They, they both had hopes and dreams. They, they, their lives made sense. But 
In the sixth month, all those plans were about to change. So let me ask you a question. How flexible are you? How open are you to, to God changing your plans into his? Have you ever asked Jesus to invade your plans and make them his? Has that ever been one of your prayers? Let's look at Joseph for a moment. You know, Matthew's Gospel will read, this is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. At least Mary received an angelic vision and visitation. At least she was let in on the change of plans in the general outline of what God was trying to accomplish through her. At least she had a say in adopting her plans to God's plan. None of that was true for Joseph. He, he was never asked. You ever think of that? Joseph was never asked. He was never invited into the decision-making process. He just had to deal with the fallout of Mary making herself available to God's plan. His soon-to-be wife was pregnant. His, his plans, his hopes, his dreams for their life together evaporated in the hard reality of a situation he had no vote in whatsoever. Of course, Mary did the right thing. She willingly went with God's interruption. She chooses God's plan and, and left God to work out the consequences and the details, including Joseph. But let's face it, when God chose to interrupt Mary's plans, he also drafted Joseph. You know, maybe you're thinking, okay, Grant, well, God drafted Joseph, but we're talking about, we're not talking about an everyday event here. You know, the time was right for God to enter the world and begin his cosmic rescue plan. And, and when you have such a transformational, world-changing plan, there's bound to be a few toes stepped on. You know, in the scheme of things, it's a small thing to step on Joseph's plans to make room for God's plan of all plans. Joseph's life is simply collateral damage in God's war against the sin and rebellion and human brokenness that destroys our lives. So the importance of the plan overshadows the plans of one man. Or at least a couple. But that doesn't mean that God's going to do the same thing in our lives, does it? It's a different thing, right? Well, well you have a point. God doesn't work in everyone's life in the same way, but the question isn't, is God going to draft us too? No, the question is, don't you know that you've already agreed to be drafted? After all, if we're followers of Christ, then Jesus is Lord as well as Savior. And we, what we did in, in the waters of baptism wasn't just dying to the old life of sin, we also died to a life lived on our own terms. We were declaring our desire to live with and for Christ. So if you're a follower of Christ, you, you've already been drafted. You've, you've already surrendered your will to his. You've already determined that God's plan for your life is better than your plans. At least you've determined that in theory. But the question remains, are you willing to live out the reality of adapting or even dropping your plans for his. So far we've seen in the coming of Christ that when God's plans intersect with our plans, our plans need to be adjusted. Or sometimes dropped altogether. But, but that doesn't mean that we somehow lose out. You see, adjusting our plans to God's plan is always the best plan. Let's dig a bit deeper. Returning to Mary's encounter with the angel, we read, The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. Let's narrow that down a little bit further. The angel said, You have found favor with God. You will be with child. 
The Greek word translated as favor is the same word that we translate as grace. And interestingly, the angel uses the word with Mary twice in this passage. In verse 28, the angel describes Mary as being highly favored because the Lord was with her. So the message of the angel is that she's the recipient of God's grace. To, to find favor is a phrase often used in the Old Testament. It speaks of God's loving kindness towards humanity. We are saved by trusting in God's loving kindness expressed through the sending of his son. God's salvation is a gift provided through Jesus' perfect sacrifice and, and his kingdom established through his resurrection. But what exactly is God's loving kindness expressed to Mary? It's the fact that she will be with child. Hold on there. Don't rush by this. Don't jump ahead. Sit in this for a moment. The angel as God's messenger is letting Mary and us in on a very important insight when it comes to God interrupting our plans. You see, God's plan for us is always filled with his grace, his loving kindness, his favor. That's why they're better than our plans. So to be used by God, to be part of his plan is an expression of Yahweh's grace to us. But it's also God's grace displayed through us. In other words, by adopting his plan, we're not only experiencing his ongoing grace towards us, we're also becoming instruments of his grace towards others. To enter his plan is to enter God's magnificent economy of transformational grace. Think about the implications. You know, what this means is that as Christians, we can never fully understand or receive God's full measure of grace if all we allow God to do in our lives is just save us. However amazing salvation is. Our full joy comes when our lives are interrupted by God's plan so that we can be his instruments to extend his grace to others. Or to put it another way, entering God's plan sets us on a path of grace that not only brings salvation, it also brings the joy of being used and transformed and sustained by God. It's, it's the means by which we are guaranteed to, to leave a legacy. It may not be a legacy recognized by others, but it will be celebrated by Yahweh himself. Let me just give you a few examples of God's grace expressed in this way. In the book of Romans, Paul says, Through him and for his name's sake, we received grace and apostleship, to call people from among all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith. Notice that Paul says that he received grace in apostleship to take the gospel to the Gentiles. In other words, Jesus interrupted Paul's life and he set him on a new path complete with the grace, the power, and the help needed to walk that new path. In Romans 12, in the context of the church is, is Christ's body, and each of us is functioning members of that body. Paul says, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. So through God's loving kindness towards us, we are given the gifts and the power to serve and to function in the church according to God's plan for our lives. What a wonderful thought. Here's an interesting passage. In, in 2 Corinthians, concerning a collection that the churches were taking up for the Christians in famine plagued Jerusalem, Paul writes, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. Grace. He goes on to describe this grace as the overflowing joy and their extreme, their overjoy, overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Then he encourages the Corinthian church to also excel in this grace of giving. Let me ask you a question. How many times have you seen the phrase overflowing joy linked to the phrase extreme poverty? Especially when it's expressed in rich generosity to others. 
This phrase can only go together when Yahweh's grace is at work. Did you know that giving is an act of grace? It's something that God enables and something that we participate in. Spend some time meditating on this passage and let it interrupt your life. We could go on and on with passages like this, but the point I'm trying to make is that we're not only saved by grace, we are also empowered and called and changed by God's loving kindness towards us. And the reason for this is that we can take our place in his plan and find our area of kingdom use. In Luke 1, 34, after Mary's been informed of God's plan that she was to have a baby, she asks, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now we need to remember that God's plan for Mary isn't just an interruption. It's a huge problem with the potential to destroy her relationship with Joseph, her relationship with her family. It has the potential to make her a cultural outsider the rest of her life. This plan is clearly going to complicate her life in a big way. But how does Mary respond? She says, how can this be? Notice Mary doesn't ask why. She asks how. How is a good question because it shows that Mary isn't removing herself from the plan. In fact, she's engaging with the plan. She wants to know how it's going to work. How does not question God's purposes? But asking why is different. Why can be a response that seeks to rescue our plan from God's hand? You know, if someone asks me to do something and I ask why, what am I saying? I'm saying, wait a minute, I haven't signed up with this plan yet. I haven't said yes. Tell me why and I'll decide if I'm in or not. But how does it do that? How is the question of someone who's already said yes? In response to Mary's question, the angel tells her about the Holy Spirit coming upon her. and Then he tells her about her relative, Elizabeth, being miraculously pregnant. And then the angel ends with these words. For nothing is impossible with God. For nothing is impossible with God. God was going to do all this. And God was going to make it happen. God was already making it happen. The impossible was happening. Elizabeth, beyond the age of having children, was having a child. That was good enough for Mary. For Mary, God's grace was greater than any potential obstacles or shame. She, she wanted to be part of God's amazing plan. She was willing to adapt her life to God's plan. But you know what? It's one thing to hear that nothing's impossible with God. But it's another thing to experience it. That only happens when, when we allow God's plan to interrupt our own. Do you really believe that nothing is impossible with God? Have you experienced that nothing is impossible with God? If you have, it's only because you've allowed Yahweh to interrupt your life. Let's move on to Joseph for a moment. As we said earlier, Joseph was never invited into the decision-making process. The only choice he had was to believe Mary and follow his heart or think about his reputation and walk away. And it's not an easy decision for him to make because he loved Mary and he was a man who was godly. All that Joseph had was his reputation as a godly man. All that he had was his standing in the community. And in choosing Mary, he would be choosing scandal and whispers and most likely lost friendships and lost income. And that's just the, t the top of the list. We know what happens. We know how the story goes. We know all the interruptions that take place, including moving to Bethlehem and then escaping as refugees to Egypt before they would return to Nazareth. 
In Matthew's Gospel, after Joseph found out about Mary's pregnancy, we're told that because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine how Joseph felt when he found out about Mary? The sense of betrayal, the, the disbelief, the pain, the crushed dreams, the broken trust, you know, it's, it's all there. This is an interrupted life. You know, I find nothing surprising in the fact that Joseph was still determined to break the engagement what I do find surprising is that he didn't just react that way. He, di he didn't just let his hurt bubble over into rage or revenge. He waited and he thought about it and he came up with a decision that was honorable and loving. Even in his supposed betrayal, he was thinking not only of himself but also of Mary and the impact his decision would have on her. But what I want to point out to you is that by taking the time to think things through, he also gave time to speak into the situation. Yeah. How often do we give God the time to speak into a situation? How many times do we act or perhaps react so quickly that we don't allow God time to inform our decisions? I've said and done things I would take back in a second if I could. Sadly, I can't. If only I'd allowed God room to speak. If I'd only considered things first. Joseph's reaction is amazing. It shows his godly character. It shows a heart ruled by love. It shows a life set on doing the right thing. It shows a heart that wanted to hear from God. It showed a heart that still loved Mary. And hear from God he did in a dream. Mary got a visit from an angel. Joseph got a dream. And that dream was enough to change his plans and sign him up for God's plan. What, what this says to me is that Joseph was ready to be used by God. He wanted to live a life serving God. He didn't need his arm twisted. He, he didn't have to be convinced. He wanted to be convinced. He didn't ask for a personal meeting or another sign. He just knew that this dream was a message from God. And the only way I can see that being the case is because he had been praying all this time to know the right thing to do. Joseph is usually background noise in the story of Jesus' birth. He's the non-speaking part of the nativity place. Some of the shepherds get more lines than him. Joseph may be a humble nobody in our estimation, but in God's economy, his importance cannot be overestimated. This brings us back full circle to the opening question. How important are you? Remember that, that God doesn't think about importance in the same way that the world does. You know, what makes Joseph and Mary so important to us, even today, isn't their worldly wealth or their tabloid exploits or their New York Times best-selling books. Their importance isn't found in money or political power. It isn't even found in their amazing accomplishments. We know and honor Joseph and Mary today because they allowed their plans to become God's plans. Simple. It's about as basic as that. We remember them because they allowed God to use them. This is the only way that we can leave a legacy that matters. Well, what about you? Are you willing to have your plans changed or even dropped so that you can join God in his plans? You know, that, that first Christmas was a dark time. God's people were living in poverty. They were oppressed and stressed. They had no idea what God was up to. They, they were confused and tired, and they longed for a life that he's something different. 
They wanted to be rescued. Sound familiar? I'm so tired of the constant stream of bad news and life's interruptions. I don't want to do this anymore. I want to pick up my toys and go home. But the thing is, what if our interrupted lives are part of God's being on the move? What if the darkness is here to point to the light like it did on that first Christmas? What if all these interruptions are priming the pump for God-sized interruptions that will mean that our lives matter in ways that we may never could have imagined? Regardless, Jesus taught us to pray for Yahweh's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. So whatever is happening, whatever may happen, we already have a role to play. We've already been drafted. We have an opportunity to take. Are you ready? Let me try to help you answer that question if whether you're ready or not. How willing are you to allow God to interrupt your life? How hard are you struggling to keep your plan moving forward even though you know deep down it's not working? How willing are you to be used by God to interrupt someone else's plans? You know, Mary knew that when she said yes, she was not only interrupting her life, she was also interrupting Joseph's life. Part of God's plan is to change the way we live. It's to change what we think is important. It's to change the way we look at the world and our place in it and to allow us to look different to the world. You know, maybe you've decided it's time to get serious. Maybe you realize that God has extended grace to you, not only to be saved, but to serve. How do you go about doing that? How do you live a life that leaves a legacy? We'll learn to ask how, not why. In order to be part of God's plan, we need to ask how. But really, I guess we can say that we... We really don't have to ask how, because Mary asked how. And Mary's answer is the same as ours. The how is through the Holy Spirit. It's through our lives. It's through our willingness to be used and to serve. Learn to take your time and allow God to work in and inform and change your plans. Could it be that we've missed some of God's plans because we didn't wait and we didn't listen and we just acted or reacted? And we need to give God room to work in our lives and make his dreams, make our dreams his dreams. Ask God to teach you that nothing is impossible with him. It's a bold thing to pray. To experience that nothing is impossible with God is also to, to experience a life in which God needs to do the impossible. It's to live a life of faith. It's to be drafted into kingdom life. I don't know about you, but, but I want to experience the grace of that first Christmas. Not only the grace of Jesus coming into the world as our Savior, but the grace of him living out his plan through me. I want a life to be so interrupted with God's plan that it's plain to everyone to see. What about you? As we come to the Lord's table, I want you to think about not only how God's plan interrupted Joseph and Mary. Remember that God's plan also completely interrupted God, the son's life as well. He became flesh. He dwelt among us and then he suffered death, even death upon the cross. How's that for interruptions? Prior to the incarnation, he only had experienced equality with God, Paul says in Philippians. He was only the interrupter. He was never the interruptee. But the son willingly became one of us and began 
the work of redeeming of all of creation. Soon sin would be interrupted. Soon the enemy's plan would be interrupted. Soon human brokenness and corruption would be interrupted. God's intentions, God's interruptions are always an expression of his rescuing grace and his extravagant love. As you meet him in this moment of interruption, that's what this is. It's, it's a moment of interruption. It's a moment when normal life intersects with divine will. Confess your sins and doubts and surrender yourself once again to live a life of heavenly interruptions. Thanks, Grant. That is a hard message to hear, especially if you've been feeling interrupted. <clears throat> and I confess I haven't always been open to the change, to the unexpected, to, to what he preferred to my plans. But when we've received this kind of grace, the only response we really can give is to offer ourselves to his interruption, just as Mary did, just as Joseph did. And so let's do this as we prepare to go to the table where, and go back to the moment where he interrupted his own life for you.
us this as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. As you go forth this week, proclaim the Lord's death. Proclaim his life in the way that you live as light in this darkness. Be a hope. Be a light. Be a, an intersection of grace in a world that has become so judgmental. Go in peace and share your peace. God bless.